fine with the cautious approach we have taken throughout this pandemic, I will also set out a number of mitigation measures that will remain in place. I will then outline changes to the requirement for self-isolation of close contacts of positive COVID cases. And finally, I will summarise the key points from new guidance being published today on arrangements for the start of the new school year. However, let me start by summarising today's statistics. The total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 1,016, which is 8.1% of all tests. There are 406 people receiving hospital care, one fewer than yesterday, and 61 people receiving intensive care, which is one more than yesterday. Sadly, nine further deaths were reported over the past 24 hours, taking the total number of registered deaths under this daily definition to 7,952. And as always, I want to convey my sincere condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one. I can also report that 4,014,212 people have now received the first dose of vaccine and 3,231,331 have now had both doses of vaccine. So all of these figures are broadly in line with the trend that has been evident for the past four weeks. The number of new cases in Scotland reached a peak in early July. At that time, more than 400 new cases per 100,000 of the population were being recorded each week. That has now fallen by two-thirds from 425 per 100,000 at the peak to 144 now, based on our most recent figures. And although, as we can see today, this fluctuates on a daily basis, the average proportion of tests that are positive has also fallen from more than 10 per cent to now less than 6 per cent. Thankfully, the number of people in hospital with COVID is also falling. In the past two weeks, it has reduced from 529 patients to 406. And the number of people in intensive care also it now seems to be declining, albeit gradually, as well. So all of this is good news, and I think it demonstrates the value of taking a careful and steady approach to easing restrictions. Another reason for this progress is, of course, the continued success of the vaccination programme. All over 18-year-olds have now had the opportunity to receive at least one dose of the vaccine, and all over 40-year-olds have been offered both doses. These were key milestones for moving beyond level zero. These milestones have been met, and take-up of vaccination has been exceptional by any previous standard, uh, or indeed uh, by comparison with our expectations. 90% of over 18-year-olds have now had at least one dose of the vaccine, and 72% of all over 18-year-olds have had both doses. 93% of over 40-year-olds have had both doses of vaccine. And indeed, for those over 60, take-up for both doses is as close to 100% as could reasonably be hoped for. Uh, there is, of course, still more to do, and I want to stress this point, especially amongst 18 to 29-year-olds. Take-up in that age group has been good uh, relative to our initial expectations, but we want it to be better. That is why, for example, we are deploying walk-in and mobile vaccination centres across the country. I can also confirm that preparatory work is underway for the next phases of vaccination. Invitations for vaccines are now going out to 12 to 17-year-olds with specific health conditions that make them more vulnerable to COVID. And this follows recent advice from the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, uh, and we expect to have offered first doses to this group by the end of August. In addition, I can advise Parliament that we are hoping to receive in the next few days updated advice from the JCVI on possible vaccination of others in the younger age groups, and we stand ready to implement any recommendations as soon as possible. And we're also preparing to deliver booster jags during the autumn for those already vaccinated, if that is indeed recommended. The vaccination programme, therefore, is likely to continue for some time to come. It may become uh, a feature of life, uh, but it has already saved many lives and achieved a huge amount of success. And I'm very grateful to everyone who has and continues to help deliver it. 
presiding officer, it is the combination of the steady decline in cases, the success of vaccination, helping to weaken the link between cases and serious illness, and of course, our understanding of the social, health and economic harms that continued restrictions cause, all underpinned by our obligation to ensure that any restrictions that remain in place are lawful, in other words, that they are both necessary and proportionate, that forms the basis for our decision today to move beyond level zero. The move beyond level zero will entail the lifting of most of the remaining legally imposed restrictions, most notably on physical distancing and limits to the size of social gatherings. It also means that from 9th August, no venues will be legally required closed. This change is significant and it is hard earned. The sacrifices everyone has made over the past year and a half can never be overstated. However, while this move will restore a substantial degree of normality, it is important to be clear that it does not signal the end of the pandemic or a return to life exactly as we knew it before COVID struck. Declaring freedom from or victory over this virus is, in my view, premature. The harm the virus can do, including through the impact of long COVID, shouldn't be underestimated, and its ability to mutate may yet pose us real challenges. So even as we make this move, uh, care and caution will still be required, which is why I now want to focus on the protections and guidance that will remain in place after August 9th. Firstly, it will continue to be the law, subject to existing exemptions, that face coverings must be worn in all the same indoor settings as is the case now. We will keep this under review, but my expectation is that face coverings are likely to be mandated in law for some time to come. Second, Test and Protect will continue to contact trace positive cases. To assist with this, there will be an ongoing requirement for indoor hospitality and similar venues to collect the contact details of customers. And while, as I will set out shortly, there will be a change in the approach to self-isolation for close contacts of positive cases, anyone who is required to self-isolate will, if eligible, continue to have access to support. Thirdly, we will continue to work closely with local incident management teams on appropriate outbreak control measures, including the use of localised restrictions in future, if necessary. We will also continue to use travel restrictions as and when necessary to restrict the spread of outbreaks and protect against the risk of importation of new variants. Fourthly, we will continue to advise home working where possible for now. I know most businesses are not planning a wholesale return to the office, but recognise that a return for some staff will be beneficial to them and to employers. But it is vital that this gradual approach continues. We will also encourage employers to consider for the longer term, as indeed the Scottish Government is doing, a hybrid model of home and office working, which may, of course, have benefits beyond the need to control a virus. Fifth, while we expect to see the careful return of large-scale events, we will, for a limited period, keep in place the processes through which organisers of outdoor events of more than 5,000 and indoor events of more than 2,000 will have to apply for permission. And this is allowing us and local authorities simply to be assured of the arrangements in place uh, to reduce the risk of large-scale gatherings. And last, but by no means least, we will continue to issue clear guidance to assist individuals and businesses uh, to reduce the risk of transmission as much as possible. Rigorous hygiene, including regular hand washing, will continue to be essential. Good ventilation will also be important. I will set out shortly our intention to strengthen guidance on ventilation in schools, but we will also work across the public and private sectors to ensure an approach to improved ventilation. And even though the law will not stipulate physical distancing from Monday, we will continue to advise the public that, especially indoors, keeping a safe distance from people in other households and avoiding crowded places will minimise risk. We will also engage with businesses and issue guidance as necessary to ensure that safe environments for staff and customers are provided and that all reasonable steps are taken to reduce the risk of outbreaks. Leading officer, I can also confirm that we continue to consider very carefully uh, the possible, albeit limited, use of COVID status certification for access to certain 
higher risk venues in future. We are currently developing an app to make access to COVID status certificates, which will include vaccination details, easier for international travel. Uh, this will be launched next month. The app will have functionality to support the use of such certificates for domestic settings, should we decide that this is appropriate. However, I want to assure Parliament that we do not underestimate the ethical, equity and human rights issues associated with COVID status certification, and we will keep members updated and consulted on our thinking on this issue. The decisions I am confirming today reflect the fact that, principally due to vaccines, we are now in a different stage of this pandemic. Vaccination has weakened the link between case numbers and serious health harms, and that means it is no longer appropriate or necessary, and therefore not necessarily even lawful, for us to rely as heavily as we did previously on blanket rules and regulations. That is something that will be welcome for many, but a source of anxiety for some. The Chief Medical Officer will be writing to those who have been at the highest risk from COVID, who might previously have been asked to shield, to provide advice and information, and to give assurance that they too can return to a much greater degree of normality. The needs and concerns of this group will not be ignored now or in the future. I want now to turn to the changes we propose to the current rules on self-isolation to ensure that they remain reasonable and proportionate. Let me be clear at the outset that these, those who have symptoms of or who test positive for COVID will still be required to self-isolate as now. However, from 9th August, an adult who is identified as a close contact of someone who has tested positive will no longer be required automatically to self-isolate for 10 days. Instead, if someone is double vaccinated with at least two weeks since the second dose, and if they have no symptoms, they should get a PCR test as soon as possible. And if the PCR test is negative, self-isolation can then be ended. Since PCR results come back quickly, frequently within 24 hours, this will greatly reduce the amount of time that many people will need to spend in self-isolation. We're proposing a similar change for people aged 17 or under, most of whom, of course, are not yet eligible for vaccination. If a young person aged 5 to 17 is identified as a close contact, they will need to take a PCR test, but they can end their self-isolation if they test negative. Children under the age of 5 will be encouraged but not required to get PCR tests. In addition, Test and Protect will implement revised guidance for under 18s, including in schools. This means that the blanket isolation of whole classes will no longer be routine. Instead, a more targeted approach will identify close contacts at higher, highest risk of infection. So fewer young people will be asked to self-isolate, and most will be asked to self-isolate for a much shorter period of time. Obviously, this is especially important as we approach the start of the new school year. So let me turn to the wider arrangements for the return of schools, uh, and updated guidance is being published today. As a consequence of the new approach to self-isolation, which is important to minimise disruption to education, and in line with advice from our expert advisory subgroup on education, we have decided to retain, for the first six weeks of the new academic term, most of the other mitigations that are currently in place in schools. This also reflects the unique environment of schools where large numbers of unvaccinated children and young people mix with adult staff. So for up to six weeks, subject then to review, there will be a continued requirement for staff to keep at least a metre distance from each other and from children and young people while on the school estate. And we've also decided, after careful consideration, to retain the current requirements for face coverings in schools for staff and for children aged 12 or over. That includes asking young people and staff in secondary schools to wear face coverings during lessons and while inside school buildings. I am acutely aware that many, many young people find this really difficult, and so it will be kept under review. But for now, we consider this an important protection for them and for others in the school. The expert advisory subgroup has also emphasised the importance of good ventilation, and we are therefore strengthening guidance in this regard. Many local authorities have already taken steps to improve ventilation in the school estate, and this work has highlighted the value of CO2 monitors. These devices are useful in assessing how well ventilated a space is, and therefore how likely it is that the virus could be present. 
The new guidance published today makes clear that all schools and daycare services for children must have access to CO2 monitoring through either fixed or mobile devices, and that these should be used to assess the quality of ventilation in schools and childcare settings and identify any necessary improvements. These assessments will be ongoing, obviously, over the coming weeks, but we expect them to be completed and necessary improvements identified by the October half term. And I can confirm today that we are making available to local authorities an additional £10 million to support this work. Ventilation is one of the most important ways in which the risk of COVID transmission can be reduced, and so improving it will be vital now and in the future to ensure that schools and childcare centres are as safe as possible. Finally, local authorities and schools will ask all secondary pupils and all school staff to take a lateral flow test one or two days before returning after the holidays and then to take tests twice a week after that. This continues to be an important additional way in which, people, in which COVID can be identified, even in people who do not have symptoms. We're also working with the further and higher education sector on plans for the year ahead, specific guidance on operating beyond level zero for universities and colleges has now been published. In addition, students will be encouraged to take a PCR test before any move to term time accommodation and then to test twice a week after that. Diving officer, the last year and a half has been, and this inevitably will be an understatement, uh, it has been difficult and stressful for children and young people, parents and all staff working in education settings. I am so grateful to them for the understanding and cooperation shown. The new school and academic term will still bring challenges. I think there is little doubt of that. But I hope it will also bring fewer disruptions and also allow a much more normal learning environment for all of our young people. Standing officer, today's decisions are, in my view, and I hope those listening will agree, uh, positive. They are possible only because of vaccination and the prolonged sacrifices of people across the country. Once again, I want to convey my deep appreciation of that to everyone across the nation. The last year has reminded all of us just how precious some of the simplest things in life really are. And many of us, I suspect, will resolve not to take them quite so much for granted in future. Undoubtedly, the best way of doing that in the short term is to continue to be careful, cautious and sensible, even as legal restrictions are lifted. The government will continue to provide guidance to help get that balance right. We all hope, I know I certainly do, that the restrictions we lift next Monday will never again have to be reimposed. But no one can guarantee that. This virus remains a threat, and as we enter winter, it may well pose challenges for us again. So as we have done throughout, the government will seek to take whatever action is necessary to keep the country safe. But has, has also been the case throughout, we all have a part to play in keeping the virus under control. And as always, although counterintuitive perhaps, it is when we lift restrictions and inevitably give the virus more opportunities to spread, that it becomes even more important for us to remember the basic actions that can reduce risk. So I want to end by stressing again what all of us can do to help ensure that this next step forward is a sustainable one. The first and most important thing is to get vaccinated. If you haven't done so already, particularly if you are in these younger age groups looking forward to resuming a more normal social life, uh, then please do so. You can register on the NHS Inform website for an appointment or by going to a drop-in centre. Second, please test yourself regularly. Free lateral flow tests are available by post through NHS Inform or collection from test sites and local pharmacies. If you test positive through one of these, uh, or if you have symptoms of the virus, you should still self-isolate and get a PCR test. Third, stick to the rules which remain in place, for example, on face coverings, and keep being sensible about the things we know can help us keep ourselves and each other safe. Meet outdoors as much as possible, especially for as long as we have reasonable weather. If you are meeting indoors, open windows, the better ventilated a room is, the safer it will be. Remember that keeping some distance from people in other households and avoiding Crowded indoor places, even if no longer legally mandated, these are still sensible precautions and continue to wash your hands and surfaces as much as possible. In short, enjoy being able to do more and meet up more. We've all waited a long time for that. But please protect yourself as you do so, principally through vaccination, and continue to take the greatest of care. 
If we all do that, we will increase our chances of keeping the virus under control. We will protect ourselves and our loved ones, and we will safely and securely return to the ways of life that we all value so much. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I look forward now, of course, to questions. Thank you. The First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 90 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question put R in the chat function now. And I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The success of Scotland and the UK's vaccination scheme means we can now look to move forward and remove almost all COVID restrictions. In advance of today's statement, my party called for the easing of restrictions to happen as planned. We highlighted the need for rules on social distancing to be removed so that businesses can get back to normal trading. We sought changes to the self-isolation rules for those who have been double vaccinated and a move towards a test for system instead of a blanket requirement to self-isolate for 10 days. And we've argued for some time for changes to self-isolation for children in schools, to prevent their learning experience from being disrupted further. For the same reason, we wanted to see the requirement for face masks in schools be removed. We proposed these steps because the vaccine is working. It is saving lives and limiting the spread of the virus. And that's why I would urge everybody to go out and get it. We are pleased the Government have listened to our suggestions. However, overall, today's statement is a mixed bag. It takes some welcome steps in the right direction, but these ongoing restrictions will hold Scotland's recovery back. When Scotland moved to Level Zero, some people were rightly confused, because Level Zero implies no restrictions, yet many rest uh, restraints remained in place. We have now moved beyond Level Zero. Again, people would rightly assume this means that COVID restrictions have been dropped, but still curbs remain in place. Yet again, the goalposts have been moved. We are beyond level zero, at level minus one or level minus two, and still the government is clinging on to large parts of people's lives. Events still have capacity constraints. The threat of local lockdowns and travel bans remain. The government seems to be U-turning on COVID status certification, home working is still being enforced, and social distancing is in a very grey area, where the legal restriction is gone, but the guidance remains in force. Clear communication is essential to maintaining public trust and compliance. There isn't uh, much clear on many fronts in this statement. People have gone through a lot. They have sacrificed and tolerated severe constraints on their lives. They have done this with impressive dedication because it was necessary and the public health data supported those decisions. But they are losing patience with these last-minute extensions and limitations on their lives without full justification or a clear idea of what comes next. So can I ask the First Minister, are you seriously considering in the future imposing another local lockdown or introducing a travel ban where people can't leave their local area? And if so, how will that be enforced? When will the limbo on social distancing end so that all the barriers are removed? And finally, can I ask the First Minister, given the scale of Scotland's drug death crisis and the heartbreaking loss of life, even at this late hour, will she finally step up and lead her government's response this afternoon? First Minister. Uh, on that last point, Angela Constance, the Minister for Drugs Policy, is standing ready to make a statement on uh, Scotland's drugs death statistics uh, as soon as I have finished making this statement. Angela was appointed by me, uh, as all ministers are, uh, and she reports directly to me. Um, and I will continue uh, to make sure that this government uh, addresses that challenge and takes the action uh, necessary. And, and Angela will set out more on that later. Um, listening to Douglas Ross there, I, I was struggling to. Uh, understand whether or not he'd, he'd listened uh, to the same statement that I, I, I delivered uh, to the chamber. I spent every single day uh, since March last year trying to deliver clear communication. I am sure I have not always succeeded. I uh, readily concede that. Uh, sometimes it feels as if Douglas Ross and his colleagues have spent many of these days trying to undermine uh, the clear communication. And I, I got a, a whiff of that again uh, today. So let me try to 
uh, take him through it again. Um, firstly, Douglas Ross is right. The Tories have called uh, for most of the changes I have announced today. Uh, the difference is they called for these changes to be made at a time when it would not have been safe to do so. It would have put people more at risk, and that is why we have continued to take a safe, uh, cautious and steady pace uh, through our exit from lockdown. Um, I think that is right and proper, and I will continue to do that, uh, whatever uh, brickbats uh, I get as a result. Because as First Minister, uh, the fundamental duty I have is to act in a way that keeps the country as safe as I possibly can. Uh, Douglas Ross called it a mixed bag of a statement. I call it sensible and cautious. It will keep people as safe as possible. And frankly, keeping the virus under control, keeping people as safe as possible, is the best thing this government can do for our economic recovery as well. Uh, most, with the exception of face coverings, um, most of the legal restrictions will be lifted from Monday. That is exactly what we said would happen. I uh, do not know that many people, um, maybe Douglas Ross is one of them, uh, who think that continuing to wear a face covering while this virus uh, continues to circulate is a, a significant hardship. Uh, most people I speak to, most people who contact me, not everybody, obviously, but most people think that is a reasonable price to pay, not so much to keep ourselves safe, but to keep others safe and therefore hope that others will do likewise to keep us safe. And that is part of the collective solidarity uh, that I think most of us feel um, as we get through this virus. Uh, and Douglas Ross said to me, am I seriously suggesting uh, that in the future I might impose local restrictions or travel restrictions? Well, let me say this very clearly to Douglas Ross. I fervently hope that will not be necessary. Um, I really, really do. And I know that if we all continue to exercise uh, the care and caution that everybody has exercised uh, for the last year and a half, then we will minimise the risk of that being necessary. But as First Minister, and you know, no more so than over this last year and a half, every single day, um, and I'm sure every leader of every government in the world will say this right now, the responsibility weighs heavily on my shoulders to keep people safe. So in direct answer to the question, if I thought action like that was necessary to restrict and curb an outbreak or spread of this virus, or perhaps a new variant of this virus that would put lives at risk and our National Health Service at risk, then no matter how difficult that would be, no matter how unpopular that might be, I would take that decision because that is what I am elected to do, to take the tough decisions to keep people safe. And If Douglas Ross does not understand that, uh, then perhaps this is not a position uh, he should ever uh, want to be in, because you have to be prepared to take those decisions, however much you hope these decisions will not be necessary. So this has been a cautious, sometimes too cautious for some people, careful, steady route through this. Monday is a significant, perhaps the, mo the most significant date so far, uh, and it is positive. But I will not shy away from saying to people, I'm not going to shout freedom um, in this respect uh, in any event. Um, I'm not going to shout freedom from this virus because I think it misleads people. The virus is circulating. The risk of new variants is there. So it is no longer proportionate to, in every respect, have legal restrictions in place, and the government has to act lawfully. But yes, of course, we will continue to advise people uh, to be sensible, to be cautious, to follow uh, routine mitigations that minimise that risk. And anybody who, thought, who thinks that is wrong um, I don't think is acting responsibly, and I will continue to, to try to do my duty as First Minister to the very best of my ability. I call Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. And can I start off by saying thank you to all of those that continue to work on our front line, particularly in our NHS, and to thank our vaccinators across the country who have got us to the point that we have got to today. They genuinely are um, heroes. And I think it's also important to recognise that people are still dying of this virus. And so my thoughts and condolences go out to all those that have lost a loved one in the last 24 hours or at any point throughout this pandemic. As the First Minister has outlined, we are now at a crucial moment in our exit from restrictions. And I want to pay tribute to our citizens across the country for the huge sacrifices they have made over the last year and a half to get us to where we are today. There is definitely light at the end of the tunnel. However, we are also at a crucial point for Scotland's recovery. It is good to see the positive improvements in the rate of cases and numbers in hospital. That is welcome. And As restrictions continue to ease, we need to ensure that people are being kept safe. That means recognising that a new period in our fight against the pandemic needs a new approach. 
Um, as we move beyond level zero, it is important that we do everything to protect the freedom that people can now enjoy again. It means retooling our vaccination effort to target those places where it lags and preparing it for the next big challenge. Um, the last few weeks have also underlined the importance of test and protect. And if increased testing is the alternative to self-isolation, then we cannot allow the resourcing of the tests and tracing system to again be neglected. But we all know how key vaccination is. We must maintain the progress and intensity of the programme. In recent weeks, the seven-day rate of vaccinations has reduced, and there are still thousands of young people awaiting their first dose, never mind their second dose. And we should be doing all we can to remove barriers to vaccination and encourage uptake. So can I ask the First Minister what plans there are to make vaccinations more accessible for those in need of a dose? For the hardest to reach, we need to take vaccination centres to the people, not people to the vaccination centres. So will we see pop-up clinics at sporting events, universities, colleges, train stations? And when will that commence? In low uptake areas, will she consider looking at door-to-door -door vaccinations to ensure that we increase uptake in those postcodes? I would also want to ask about ongoing support for Scotland's businesses and employers. Today's news will be welcome for many businesses, including nightclubs, that have been closed now for up to 18 months. But these businesses will not bounce back immediately. So how will the Scottish Government ensure that livelihoods are protected as Scottish businesses can have, continue to have confidence in their recovery? Um, there are also now recommendations for some clinically vulnerable school-aged young people to get the vaccine and a booster programme in the autumn. There is also the hope that eligibility will be extended more widely for young people. So what guarantee can the First Minister provide that all eligible 12 to 17-year-olds will receive their first dose before the return to school in less than two weeks. Um, I think there does seem to be a slip in target outlined today. And what preparation work is now being done if we do get further eligibility for 12 to 17-year-olds? Uh, and finally, for booster and flu vaccine, when will individuals most at risk receive details of how the autumn booster programme will run? Uh, the JCVI interim advice suggests that that should start in September. Is that looking like a reality? And will the details be shared uh, with Parliament? These questions are not just essential for keeping individuals safe, but also protecting our NHS into the winter. After so much restriction, it is only right that we move heaven and earth to protect our return to some level of normality. And again, can I thank everyone across our country for the huge sacrifices they have made and they continue to make in the face of this pandemic. First Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, these are all perfectly... Uh, reasonable questions. I'll try to go through them all. I think I've noted them all down. If I miss any of the points of detail, I'll either return to them uh, later or uh, right uh, afterwards. Um, most of them are about vaccinations. So I'll spend most of uh, my, my response on that issue. Um, I think the only thing I would take issue with in Anna Sarwar's uh, questioning is uh, perhaps a, a turn of phrase, which I don't think is, is a reasonable one, where uh, all, some young people were described as still awaiting a first dose. Uh, all over 18s have been offered uh, a first dose. Some have not taken up that offer, uh, but awaiting makes it sound as if they haven't been offered it. We are still uh, and will continue to work to get uptake rates as high as possible. Uptake rates are high, um, higher than perhaps I might have uh, anticipated in the younger age groups, but not as high as we want them to be. Overall, our vaccination programme is going extremely well. Um, I think in terms of percentage of the total population, we are uh, certainly above England and Northern Ireland on first and possibly now on second doses as well, but all four nations are doing uh, well in this. But our vaccination programme is a success, and I think everybody uh, should recognise that because it is down to the hard work of those that Anna Sarwar rightly pays tribute to. Um, in terms of the first question, will we have more pop-up vaccination uh, clinics or, or, or sites? Yes, is the answer to that. We're looking at all possible ways to uh, access young people where young people are, as opposed to uh, expecting young people to go to clinics. Now, we can't get everywhere that young people spend their time. I had a conversation this morning about, uh, and this is just a, a conversation at the moment. It's not necessarily something that will definitely happen, but uh, talking to the nighttime industry uh, about as nightclubs open, whether there are ways there of using that uh, to extend vaccination to young people. So, you know, sporting uh, sites, places that young people uh, go to regularly, these are all places that we are looking to get promotion of vaccine into and where possible and practical to actually get vaccination uh, to or near as well. Um, I have 
perhaps more scepticism, although I would never rule anything out about door to door, um, just in terms of uh, the, 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 the labour intensive uh, nature of that, given that the vast majority of eligible pe people are vaccinated. So you would be uh, going to a lot of effort uh, and going to a lot of doors where everybody was vaccinated. So I've got a, a scepticism about whether that is the best way to, to go. Uh, but we, of course, uh, don't rule anything out. We want to get uh, to as many people as possible. Uh, on the JCVI uh, points, uh, yes, we are trying to get to eligible uh, 12 to 17 year olds uh, as far as possible before schools go back. I said building in um, a, a bit uh, of uh, understandable flexibility there, uh, given the, the nature of this group, that we will uh, certainly be doing offering first doses by the end of August, but we want to do that as quickly um, as possible between now and school return. Of, of course, not all schools go back on the same day. Some of them uh, go back further into August than others. As I said in my statement, we are hoping to get updated advice from the JCVI over the next day or so. Um, I hope JCVI are our uh, advisory body, so they have to give us the advice they think is right, and I respect that. I am hoping it will recommend uh, going further on the vaccination of young people. I am particularly concerned, uh, if possible, to get vaccination to 16 and 17 year olds, which is obviously important for those who will be, for example, going to college and university and mingling with older uh, young people who are vaccinated. But we'll see uh, what that advice brings. But we stand ready to implement that as quickly as possible. And uh, we wait the final position on booster vaccinations. My expectation is that there will be some form of booster programme. We're, we're just assuming that in order to get the preparations underway and would uh, look to notify people uh, as we go through the next few weeks and uh, certainly into September. Uh, and finally, I think on businesses, the most important thing we can do for businesses is not just get them open again. And as of Monday, there will be no business legally required to close under COVID regulations. Uh, but also to build the confidence of their customers to start using their services again. And that is also one of the reasons why a cautious and uh, careful approach is required. Because if people don't feel safe in venues, they will be less likely to go. And we'll be working with businesses uh, to encourage businesses to think very carefully about the environment that they're offering for uh, their customers as well. Uh, we will continue to consider financial support for as long as necessary, but of course uh, we want to get businesses trading and making uh, money again because we don't have uh, infinite sums of money to uh, spend on business support. Uh, and the last thing I would again encourage the UK government to do is extend furlough uh, for longer so that we're not cutting that support to businesses uh, earlier than is I think appropriate for many. So I think I've covered uh, most of those points, but if there are others uh, that I've missed, I will come back to them later. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the First Minister, uh, as well as Douglas Ross and Anna Sarwar, have all recognised the importance of the vaccination programme. Uh, everybody, I think, recognises that the people who developed it and delivered it are due our immense gratitude. It has saved lives and is continuing to do so. But I think it's also recognised that vaccination is not a cure-all. It doesn't eliminate all risk. It doesn't prevent everybody uh, from being exposed to this virus or from the risk of becoming extremely seriously ill uh, or having their life put at risk. So I'm concerned that there is still a great deal of emphasis on this idea of COVID status certificates, so-called uh, vaccine passports, particularly as the First Minister refers to them in relation to higher risk venues. It raises human rights implications if our ability to, to live our lives is dependent on our health status. It raises inequality issues if the workers in those higher risk venues are not themselves fully protected. And ultimately, can the First Minister agree, is it not the case that only direct mitigation measures to make those higher risk venues less risky is actually going to give us the protection that we need. Data certificates will not achieve that. First Minister. Again, I think these are 
perfectly reasonable uh, questions. I've got a lot of sympathy with, with all of them. Firstly, uh, Patrick Harvey is right to say that vaccines, although hugely effective and uh, the programme is, is hugely successful, do not eliminate all risk and all harm from the virus. And we have never said uh, that vaccination does that. What we do know, and I think we now have uh, lots of evidence of this, is that they significantly weaken the link between somebody getting COVID and becoming seriously ill from COVID. Don't eliminate that risk, particularly if somebody might have other underlying health conditions, but they have weakened that. And we can see that um, in the uh, still concerning but much lower uh, level of hospital cases in this wave than we've had in previous waves. Uh, there is less certainty about the impact on transmission uh, of the virus, uh, but we hope it has a positive effect there. Uh, Vaccination, I don't think we can overstate the importance of vaccination and where we are now and where we hope to continue in the future. Uh, but we have to, as we have to be realistic and uh, frank about all of these things, we have to recognise the limitations as well as celebrate the enormous success. Um, uh, Patrick Harvey said I put a lot of emphasis on COVID status uh, certification. I, if that's how it sounded, I, I want to try to redress that. I wasn't seeking to emphasise it or somehow uh, pull it out as being the big next thing that we're definitely going to do. Um, I wanted to be frank with Parliament that we are keeping our options open. So in the app we're developing, uh, I think it's important to be frank uh, with Parliament that there will be functionality that we are not immediately planning to use, but there will be functionality that we could use in future if we decided to do this for domestic certification, because the principle objective of the app is to make access to certificates easier for international travel. That does not mean we have taken any decisions. I am highly cautious about uh, COVID passports, to give them the colloquial term, for all the reasons that Patrick Harvey has set out. I would be fundamentally opposed, um, passionately and fundamentally opposed to their use for access to public services or anything that was seen as something essential for people to access. Um, I don't think they are a replacement for sensible mitigations, and I agree with that point. But I think there is a debate to be had about whether in some venues that are optional in terms of people's attendance at them, and where we know there is a higher risk of transmission, that we at least think about whether they could play some part in making these uh, settings safer uh, than they might otherwise be. There would have to be uh, agreed exemptions in place because there are people, as we know, who, who cannot get vaccinated. So I, I'm simply not ruling this out because I don't think it would be responsible to do it. Uh, but I think people can hear, if they didn't hear it in my original statement, I think they can hear it now. I am far from convinced uh, that it is a road we should go down. But I don't want to close off Parliament's options, or the government's options, or the country's options. But I do give an undertaking that we will continue not just to update Parliament, but to consult and involve Parliament as our thinking on this, or if our thinking on this develops to the point where we were proposing the introduction of uh, COVID certification for any particular setting. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Only a few short weeks ago, Scotland had record numbers of daily cases, amongst the highest in Europe, and testing protect was buckling under the pressure. Thankfully, the figures are now going in the right direction, but as we look ahead to winter, it's a chastening reminder that systems must be built and staffed to withstand whatever the virus throws at them. Like others, I also pay tribute to all those involved in the vaccine programme. But like Patrick Harvey, I'm concerned that the government is still humming and hawing about domestic vaccine passports, a full nine months after we first pressed them for a decision. Last week, John Swinney said it would be the wrong way to handle it. Now there will be an app for our phones paving the way uh, for vaccine passports by stealth. So why, given what the First Minister has just said, won't the government rule out domestic vaccine passports? First Minister. We're not planning anything by stealth. I've stood here today in front of Parliament and been frank about the options that we are leaving open um, and given an undertaking to Parliament that we'll be full and upfront and consult Parliament um, in any decision. So, you know, I I'm sorry, that is not doing something by stealth. It's actually quite the opposite of, of that. Before I come back to vaccine passports, because, you know, it's important and I, 
I, as I said to Patrick Harvey, and as I've said before, I am far from convinced that they are the right thing to do, but I'll explain in a moment why we're not simply ruling them out uh, for every uh, possibility at this stage. But before I do that, just there was a first part of the question about test and protect. Test and protect, as it will always do when cases are surging, came under pressure in uh, July. It did not buckle under that pressure. It adapted and coped with that pressure um, and is performing well. And I want to thank everybody in Test and Protect. The work they have done has played a part in getting us to the point, from the point where we did have some of the highest case rates, uh, or even at one point, the highest case rate in Europe, to a point where we've got a much lower case rate. And uh, we're certainly uh, there or thereabouts. I think Wales might still just be below us, but we've got uh, the, the second lowest, maybe heading towards the lowest case rate uh, in the UK. Um, these trends come and go, um, and it's what you do to try to stop cases surging, but when they do surge, to get them under control that matters. And people working across our public health teams have done an excellent job in the last few weeks to get us into the much stronger position we are in today, as indeed has the public. Um, finally, presiding officer, why don't I just rule out uh, vaccine passports? Um, I won't repeat everything I've said about my scepticism and healthy degree of caution about them, because people have heard me say it. But if there's one thing I have learned, and I like to think I've learned more than one thing over these past uh, grim, challenging, difficult 18 months for everybody, is that in the face of an infectious virus that keeps learning to run faster than us, uh, that keeps changing itself to make the challenge ever more difficult, uh, after 18 months of having to ask people to live their lives in the most restricted and unnatural uh, manner imaginable. I don't think it's sensible just to rule things out uh, for, uh, for ideological or, or other reasons. I think you've got a duty, and I've got a duty, to properly consider every possible step we could take to get our lives back to normal and to keep them normal while protecting people from the virus. Does that mean we will do every possible step, take every possible step? No, there will be uh, things that we do decide are, are not right to do in vaccine passports, and in total or in part, maybe one of those. But I don't think it's responsible in the face of everything we've lived through and in the face of what we're still having to deal with to just blithely, as a politician, rule these things out. So I will continue to keep an open mind to anything that keeps this country safe while also allowing it to get back to normal. I call Alistair Allen to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Presiding officer, the cut to Calmax passenger carrying capacity to 35 per cent, while it was obviously done for understandable health reasons, has very seriously impacted every aspect of island life since ferry routes came under pressure at the beginning of the tourist season. Can the First Minister confirm whether passenger capacity will now be returning to something more like normality as a result of today's statement? And also, as the First Minister will be aware, visitors tend to book ferry tickets far in advance, while islanders travelling to see family, care for sick relatives, or just get to work tend to need to book at much shorter notice, meaning they are at present simply unable to compete for spaces on ferries. What can be done to ensure islanders now have more equitable access to ferry bookings? First Minister. Well, can I thank Alistair Allen um, for that question, and I know uh, the sentiments behind it uh, will be felt very strongly by uh, other members representing island communities. Physical distancing has restricted capacity on ferries, and that has resulted in significant problems for people travelling to and from the islands. And while that's frustrating for anybody wanting to travel to or from our islands, it is particularly difficult and has been horrendously difficult for those who live on our islands. Um, and I understand that and want to thank people for uh, the forbearance that they have shown. Um, in light of today's announcement, though, uh, around physical distancing, operators will be able to make more foot passenger capacity available from Monday, uh, and that will ease some of the problems that Alistair Allen is talking about. There will continue to be a slightly reduced number of timetable sailings on some routes due to the continued need for enhanced cleaning regimes, because obviously it remains important on our ferries, like in uh, other settings, that we keep the environment as safe as possible. And regarding uh, the essential travel needs of islanders, um, I can confirm that 
Uh, some capacity is being held back for turn up and go travel. Uh, and in addition, islanders are also guaranteed a space on the ferry and indeed a taxi for urgent medical appointments. So this has been difficult. I hope today's announcement uh, operational from Monday will lead to a significant easing of the challenges that islanders have faced. Thank you. I call Myrtle Fraser to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to ask the First Minister more about vaccines for young people, which she alluded to earlier. There are many 17-year-olds, uh, shortly to turn 18, who will be leaving home for the first time to take up a university place within the next few weeks, who would welcome the reassurance of a vaccination that is not currently being offered to them. Given that time is very short for this group, how quickly can the Scottish Government make a decision on offering them a vaccination? First Minister. Well, as Murdo Fraser uh, knows, or, or certainly should know, we are waiting on JCVI advice. I say we, um, obviously referring to the Scottish Government, but the UK Government, the Welsh Government, the Northern Irish Government are in the same position. Um, I think I indicated from the platform behind me last week in a press briefing that uh, the four CMOs had asked the JCVI to look again at uh, their advice on vaccination for young people. I know uh, our own Chief Medical Officer has also written uh, to the JCVI. Um, I am hoping, um, possibly veering towards expecting, um, updated advice from the JCVI literally in the next day or so, um, and I very much hope that that expectation will prove to be the case. I am hoping, but this is for the JCVI to advise, that they will recommend uh, further vaccination of people in the 12 to 17-year-old age group. Um, I, assuming it is safe and the risk-benefit analysis bears this out, I would like to see us in the fullness of time be able to offer vaccination. Obviously, informed consent would determine uptake, but offer vaccination to all people in that age group. But I am particularly hopeful that we will see some updated recommendations in relation uh, as a priority, as a first uh, part of this, uh, for 16 and 17 year olds. So I am as anxious as anybody to get this. I think mean, you can probably hear that in my voice. I'm as anxious as anybody, perhaps more than uh, many, to get this updated advice as quickly as possible. And I'm anxious uh, to see uh, whether it advises what I'm hoping it does. And I will advise, uh, part, I'm sure the JCVI will make its advice known in the way it chooses, um, but I will set out uh, as soon as possible, depending on what that advice turns out to be the steps that the government will take to implement it as soon as possible. Left Stevenson to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the First Minister for her statement and providing an update on the welcome rollout of the vaccination for under 18s. I recently met some young people with autism in East Kilbride and we discussed the vaccination programme. I would be grateful if the First Minister could set out the steps being taken to ensure people with autism who want to get the drag feel able to do so. First Minister. Well, I think that is really important that we give people who are being offered uh, vaccination the confidence and the ability to come forward and get vaccination. Um, as Colette Stevenson will be aware, the most recent advice from the JCVI recommends that children and young people aged 12 to 17 with certain underlying health conditions, including uh, severe learning disabilities, will be offered the vaccine. Uh, there is information uh, to assist those who might face particular challenges or be anxious about visiting a vaccination centre, which will include some individuals with autism. I recognise that. Uh, there's information available on the NHS Inform website, and we will continue to do everything we can to make the process of vaccination, particularly for those who will find that most challenging, as easy and as straightforward as possible. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Paul McLennan. I want to ask the First Minister about long COVID clinics. I know the Scottish Government has funded research into long COVID, and a recent report from both Stirling and Robert Gordon Universities recommended specialist and integrated services to deal with long COVID. 
England have spent 34 million on 80 specialist clinics with another 23 planned. Wales has spent 5 million on specialist clinic clinical pathways. That's not matched in Scotland. And there is as many as 110,000 people suffering from long COVID, including children, and they are simply not getting the support and treatment they desperately need. So can I ask the First Minister, when will the Scottish Government act to provide dedicated support and treatment for people who suffer from long COVID? And will she or the Cabinet Secretary for Health agree to meet with representatives of Long COVID Scotland? First Minister. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will be happy uh, to meet uh, with anyone who wants to discuss these issues. I understand uh, that he has recently met uh, with uh, one of uh, our MSP colleagues uh, from the Conservative benches to discuss uh, these issues. Um, can I uh, say we are committing significant sums of money to understanding long COVID so that we can as quickly as possible make sure that the right resources are in place. I will come on to specialist clinics in a moment, but we should not lose sight of the fact that for many people suffering from long COVID, it is access to generalist services, GP and, and other uh, services uh, that they will first uh, want to make sure that they can have. And we want people to be treated uh, for any health conditions as accessibly and as close to home as possible. Um, I, Jackie Bailey said the UK government have dedicated £34 million uh, to long COVID specialist clinics. Um, I, I do not knock any money that is spent on these things, and, and the Scottish government certainly will uh, dedicate resource to appropriate specialist clinics um, in the, the, the coming period. Um, but I simply ask people to, to, to take a, a step back and, and analyse that. Uh, £34 million in an English context is about £3 million for Scotland. You are not genuinely going to get many real clinics for that amount of money. So I, I would question you know, to the, the extent to which some of uh, the, the headlines we hear um, are matched by the, the reality of provision. I think it is important that we do make sure we have got the right specialist provision in place, but we build that on the basis of the best understanding. Our understanding will obviously develop as our research develops, but we build that from an evidential base and that we do it properly, um, rather than me saying, here is £3 million, knowing that that is not going to deliver a lot of you know, specialist clinics. We need proper investment and we need proper uh, development of the understanding that will make sure that uh, specialist provision does what we require it to do. I call Paul McLennan to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, restrictions on international travel play an important role in our response to the pandemic, guarding against the importation of new cases. Can the First Minister provide an update as to the Scottish Government's latest engagement with the UK Government to ensure that a joined-up approach can be taken to international travel where possible? First Minister. Uh, we continue to try where we think the UK Government is taking the right approach to coordinate and have a Four Nations approach. And Broadly speaking, our approach on international travel at this point uh, is consistent across the four nations. It has not always been the case, because there have been times where we have thought uh, that a more rigorous approach was required. So uh, we are uh, working hard. I think all four governments are working hard to try to coordinate uh, both the, the substance of our policy approaches and the announcement. We do not always uh, succeed in getting that four nations uh, Cooperation. Uh, I think there were some frustrations in the last couple of weeks about announcements that were made uh, ahead of that Four Nations agreement uh, to, to make the announcements. But we will continue to do that. I do not want travel restrictions to be in place any more than I want any other form of restrictions to be in place. But again, we would be irresponsible, given that perhaps the biggest risk we face in the, the next phase of this pandemic is from a new variant that uh, I so hope this never happens, but the possibility of a new variant that may start to challenge the efficacy of our vaccine. So we have to keep in the toolbox the tools to deal with that as effectively as possible. And of course, given the, the nature of the, the island we live on, the more consistency across the different governments, the better. But my first and uh, most important responsibility is to take the decisions I think are right for Scotland, and, and we'll continue to seek to do that. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SNP manifesto promised to set out a national recovery plan for the NHS within 100 days of the election, which is fast approaching. With a potential winter crisis, 
hurtling towards us and a requirement for booster jags in the autumn. I'd like to ask the First Minister if she believes that the NHS should have to wait weeks for her health secretary to publish a rebirth mobilisation plan when health services are already overstretched with a backlog of cancellations, staffing issues and an urgent need for additional support. First Minister. Yes, I do think it is right that my health secretary takes the time to consult uh, not just with uh, officials working in the health department here in the Scottish Government, but with uh, people across the health service to make sure that our NHS recovery plan, which will not be a plan for the next weeks or months, but will be a plan for uh, the probably the, the duration of this parliament, that we get that right and we do the proper work uh, to, to ensure that it is a solid, uh, deliverable, ambitious plan that the health service needs. It will be published within the 100 days as we uh, committed to and uh, parliament can scrutinise it when that is the case. Of course, we continue to give uh, additional support to the NHS now. Uh, the NHS is not simply uh, doing nothing, uh, waiting for this plan. The NHS is already in a process of recovery supported by additional resource and other support from uh, the Scottish Government, and that will continue to be the case. And of course, uh, while I wish it could be more, because they deserve as much as we could ever uh, give them, uh, we've also given our hard-working NHS and uh, staff uh, the best pay rise anywhere in the UK, because we recognise that without our staff, uh, the NHS uh, can't do what it does. So we'll continue to support the NHS uh, in the best way we possibly can, as it continues to cater for those with COVID, and there are many COVID patients still in our hospitals, but increasingly it gets the health service back to being uh, the service that deals uh, with people regardless of their conditions and does so as quickly uh, as possible and to the high standards that all of us uh, know that we can expect from our National Health Service. There are many, many members requesting the opportunity to ask a question today, and I would be very grateful if we could have succinct questions and responses. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In September, the UK Government plans to end the furlough scheme and the £20 uplift in universal credit. Does the First Minister agree with me that this will be a disaster for businesses and people in low incomes? And can I ask what engagement the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government to ask for a reversal of these damaging plans? First Minister. I very much agree with Rona Mackay on both of these points, and we continue to engage um, on a regular basis with the UK Government seeking to persuade it to change its position, both on uh, furlough and on uh, the clawback of the increase to universal credit. On uh, furlough, I think I've uh, addressed this point already in response to a previous question. Businesses, although we want to get businesses back trading normally as quickly as possible, need support uh, for as long as uh, is required, and I think the premature ending of furlough will be uh, very damaging to many people's jobs across the country. And even at this late stage, I would urge the Chancellor to change his mind and give a further extension uh, to furlough. Um, and on universal credit, I, I don't know how anybody in good conscience, having given an uplift to universal credit um, to people who are struggling the most from all of the uh, we're struggling the most before COVID and are probably struggling the most from many of the impacts of COVID. To, to suddenly claw that money back at a time like this is unconscionable. Um, it will take uh, perhaps over £1,000 a year from people who need it most, um, and it should not happen. Um, so I'm urging uh, the Chancellor to change position on furlough. I would go even stronger than that. Do not take, the mo take money out of the pockets of those who can least afford it. Make the uplift to universal credit permanent and make that clear without any further delay to do anything else would simply be unforgivable. Neil Bibby, to be followed by Willie Coffey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is widespread concern about compliance with COVID safety rules and wearing of face coverings on public transport. Ministers were exercised about the actions of LMER, but what action have they taken to address compliance on ScotRail services and bus services in Scotland? This is not a small minority of cases. Why are levels of compliance on public transport not good enough? And since the First Minister stated today that face coverings will still be required, what confidence can the passengers have that rules will be adequately enforced next week? Because this isn't happening right now. First Minister. We have got to continue to support compliance, and that has a number of different strands in all ways. And as we ease restrictions in some areas, 
it's all the more important that those we still think uh, are required, uh, that there is high compliance. I know very well uh, how difficult it can be uh, for people to be compliant 100% of the time with all of these measures, um, and you know that's not easy for anybody. Um, but it is really important that we all do that. So we will continue to uh, communicate clearly to the public about why we're asking for certain things, including face coverings, to be done, and we will continue to engage with and support uh, businesses, including ScotRail, to uh, enforce um, and to encourage uh, people to do uh, the things that we consider. Uh, are necessary. And we've all got a part to play in this, obviously, from our own compliance, encouraging compliance on the part of others, um, and making sure that we communicate widely about the, the need for this. Uh, one, one final point I would make here is that as we lift restrictions, people should understand that if there are things we are still mandating in law, then there must be a good reason for that. Um, and that is the case with face coverings. If you wear one, then you're protecting others, and if others wear one, they're protecting you. So it is one of the remaining things that we can all do to protect each other, and I would encourage everybody, no matter who they are, eh, to make sure they do that. Willie Coffey to be followed by Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you. On the 25th of March today, the Scottish Parliament went into recess for our election. The UK Government announced that £1.5 billion was being made available for a discretionary relief scheme for businesses outside of the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors, and Scotland's share of that was to be £145 million. By the 16th of July, in a written answer to me, we still had not seen a penny of that money. Could I ask the First Minister if there has been any progress in releasing this money to Scotland, as many of our local businesses are still feeling the impact of COVID and need further help? And will she press the case until this is resolved? First Minister. Um, yes, we will continue to press the case until uh, such times as uh, that money flows. And then, of course, it's up to the Scottish Government to make sure it flows quickly to those who need it. Um, I will uh, check with uh, the Finance uh, Secretary and uh, her officials to see what the current uh, state of play is with that particular uh, funding and write to Willie Coffey as soon as possible. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Marie McNair. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, my question relates to unsuitable accommodation orders. Charities like Shelter Scotland in Crisis hear from people day in, day out about the poor conditions they are facing in temporary accommodation like B&Bs and hotels, from lack of space or basic cooking and cleaning facilities to intimidation by staff or arbitrary curfews that limit people's opportunity to work and live normal lives. I therefore ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government is planning to delay the full implementation of the unsuitable accommodation order, which will leave more families living in hotel rooms. First Minister. Uh, we do not want any suspension or delay uh, to that to be any longer than necessary. I uh, absolutely um, share the view that we should not uh, have people in unsuitable accommodation and uh, that while COVID has caused unavoidable um, disruption and difficulties for local authorities, uh, we need to make sure uh, that they do not last for any longer than necessary. I know this is something the Social Justice Secretary uh, has been looking closely at, and I will ask her to uh, write to the member with an update on the current situation as soon as possible. Marie McNair to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, President Officer. With school pupils going across Western Bartcher and Eastern Bartcher, preparing for the new school term, can the First Minister outline what communications DEAL the Education Secretary has had with unions, teacher and parents associations to ensure a smooth transition of pupils and staff returning, so that both pupils and staff feel safe and supported? First Minister. Well, there is ongoing engagement with local authorities, uh, teachers, unions, uh, parents uh, and young people themselves that has throughout the pandemic. Uh, taking place under the umbrella of the Education Recovery Group. Um, I indicated in my statement we are publishing, it, uh, probably already published by now, uh, updated guidance today, uh, setting out the expectations uh, of mitigations that will be in place in school from the start of the term. I went through some of those in my opening statement. I, I suspect the position on self-isolation is what will get most attention today um, and the continuation of face coverings, but in, in many respects the most important 
part of that that I outlined today was to strengthen guidance around ventilation in schools and the additional funding that we're making available to local authorities to ensure CO2 monitoring in schools uh, and the use of that to assess whether further improvements to ventilation are required. Um, and local authorities, I know, will be continuing to liaise with schools, pupils and parents ahead of the school return to make sure that all appropriate steps, including around uh, LFD testing, are taken. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know vaccination does not prevent all infections or transmission of the virus. We also know that many young people will not be fully vaccinated by the time colleges and universities are due to resume in just a matter of weeks. Many college courses in particular require students and lecturers to be physically present because of the high proportion of practical learning and yet they still don't have the information they need to plan effectively. Safety should be the top priority, but how can lecturers plan and prepare courses safely when they don't even know if their whole class will be able to attend at the same time? When will guidance for our colleges and universities be available? First Minister. As I think I said in my uh, opening statement, there has been uh, guidance uh, published uh, for further in higher education, but there is further work uh, continuing to make sure uh, that the arrangements that will be in place for the start of the new academic term are appropriate ones. Um, it will be the case that all over 18-year-olds will have been offered, uh, all over 18-year-olds have been offered a first dose already, um, and then eight weeks on from that, by mid-September, uh, all 18-year-olds will have, uh, who have been vaccinated will have been offered uh, their second dose, and we continue to encourage uptake. I've already said that we hope, uh, although this is dependent on JCVI advice, to move with vaccination into uh, slightly younger age groups as well. Um, and there are also uh, issues uh, that I've already set out today around our expectations on testing uh, for students. And I know colleges and universities will be looking closely, not just at the the position with uh, the move beyond level zero and what that means in terms of legal uh, requirements, but what also uh, is a sensible and safe approach to uh, the mix of on-site learning and remote learning. And as well as guidance being published, I would expect uh, learning institutions uh, to be liaising both with their staff and with their students well in advance of the new term. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Neil Gray. Thank you. The First Minister rightly acknowledged the deep sacrifices made by the hospitality sector, with some businesses shut for the full 18 months. But there is still some clarity required in relation to vaccine certification and mask wearing indoors. Will the First Minister clarify mask wearing in nightclubs, weddings and concerts? While well, dancing in clubs or weddings, for instance, is a key scenario, there is some confusion about how this is intended to work in practice. So I wonder if the First Minister can give me any details now, and can she give me an assurance that she will engage with the sector as soon as practically possible to discuss this, and how they may have confidence that they can operate in this new environment, and give them the clarity that they need. First Minister. Um, as I said earlier on, we are retaining uh, the requirement to wear face coverings in indoor settings, uh, where that is required just now, so in pubs and restaurants, uh, except when you are sitting down to eat or drink, uh, when you are moving around, you require to wear face coverings. Uh, nightclubs have not been open. Uh, I think it is important that we have similar mitigations in all indoor settings, but yes, we will be engaging uh, with the nighttime industry sector. Um, about exactly how we would hope, as they are able to reopen from Monday, uh, they will ensure that the right mitigations are in place and what will be expected of them, as well as uh, what we would encourage them to do. You know, I, it's a long, long time, uh, I have to say, since I was in a nightclub. Um, maybe I should get back there sometime, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's a long time since I was a regular frequenter of nightclubs, but I've had some discussions in the past few days about, you know, the allowing nightclubs to open again as everybody wants to do and what restrictions might be necessary and, and clearly there are some restrictions that just would make no sense because whether you know even if a nightclub was technically allowed to open it would make it um, really impractical so I'm saying that simply to reassure that as we finalize guidance for the reopening uh, we will 
make sure that we don't stint on appropriate safety measures, but we will be mindful of the practical realities um, in settings like nightclubs. One thing I would take the opportunity to say on nightclubs uh, to young people, if there are any young people listening to me right now, and if they are, they probably switched off when I said it's a long time since I've been in a nightclub. But if you intend over the next few weeks to go back to a nightclub, and who, who could blame you for that? Please make sure you're back. If you're over 18, make sure you've got your vaccine before you do, uh, because that will help protect you. We want people to be able to responsibly enjoy things again, but protect yourself as you do. Um, you'll be taking away, or not taking away, but reducing the risk of becoming ill, and you'll be helping to protect others as well. So for all the, the detail around the return of nightclubs, that's an important one that I don't think any of us should overlook. Neil Gray to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the First Minister for her statement, which contained much very welcome news. The First Minister rightly emphasised how difficult the last 18 months has been for our school pupils, staff and parents. But can she therefore expand on her expectations for the return of school in the coming weeks after the initial six-week period is over? Can pupils expect to be able to take part in larger assemblies with singing, for example? And does she also expect parents to be able to enter school buildings for meetings and events in the coming weeks? First Minister. Uh, yeah, the, the guidance that we're publishing today or have published today will set out much of the detail of this in terms of, uh, you know, for example, uh, early year settings about the ability of parents to, to go in there again. We do want to uh, move forward uh, in that direction. Uh, the decision around keeping most of the current mitigations in schools was not an easy one because I know from speaking to young people, you know, young people I know in my own life as well as uh, many other young people, that having to wear a face covering in the classroom is not something they enjoy doing, although many of them, I think, do feel that it gives them some added protection. But these are the kind of things that we don't want to have in place for any longer than is strictly necessary. But it was the clear advice of the education subgroup that if we were to change the position on self-isolation, as we wanted to do to minimise disruption, and given the unique nature of schools with unvaccinated young people and adults coming together in large numbers, it was appropriate and proportionate to keep these other mitigations in place for a longer period. We said the first six weeks that will be reviewed on an ongoing basis, and obviously if we decide to extend beyond six weeks, we would set the reasons for that uh, clearly. But getting there are a few things more important than getting schools and the lives of young people back to something as close as possible to normality and doing that as quickly as possible, and that is something that uh, we are very, very focused on. Liz Smith to be followed by Audrey Nicholl. Uh, thank you. Just in relation to that, uh, First Minister, the COVID self-isolation and social distancing rules prevented our outdoor education centres from any residential purposes, which of course is the main source of their income. And they are desperate for more clarity from the Scottish Government about when they will be able to reopen for residential purposes. So can I ask that information is now available? First Minister. Um, I will ensure uh, that uh, there is contact made with uh, the residential, uh, outdoor residential uh, sector um, as soon as possible, uh, today or tomorrow, to discuss in detail uh, what today's changes uh, mean for it. Because while well, we did uh, try to support the sector, with, uh, as, uh, if memory serves me correctly, with additional money, uh, but also allowing as much of their activity to happen uh, as possible, uh, the absence of residential stays has been uh, very difficult, and we want to get that back to normal as quickly as possible. Audrey Nicholl, to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, along with my Aberdeen Donside MSP colleague, I attended a briefing with the Scottish coordinator of a UK veterans charity and heard a sobering account of the multiple challenges that homeless veterans in the North East are continuing to face, a situation exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. I am aware the Scottish Veterans Commissioner report, Housing, Making a Home in Civilian Society, is currently being considered by ministers. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister what updates she can provide on progress in considering and acting upon the recommendations made in the report? First Minister. Uh, veterans issues are always 
extremely important to the government, and I think particularly given the impact on many veterans of COVID, uh, we recognise the responsibility to take forward uh, these recommendations as fully and as quickly as possible. Um, I can't give a, a conclusion to, uh, I can't outline the conclusion uh, of that today. I know these uh, matters are under active consideration uh, by the Veterans Minister, uh, who of course is a veteran himself, Keith Brown, the, the Justice Secretary, uh, and I'll ask Keith Brown to uh, write to the member with an update as quickly as uh, he is able to do so, having given the issues uh, the proper consideration that they merit. Data Boy Act to be followed by Stuart McMillan. First Minister, I have had constituents in touch upset about the cost of testing in advance of people travelling abroad. Couldn't the NHS charge a nominal fee to provide the service and cover the costs while ensuring a safe, reliable public service is available? Not all travels for holidays. Many people have families abroad or need to travel for work, especially those who work in the transport sector. And, and just to say, First Minister, I'm still waiting for the response from the Cabinet Secretary for Health to my, to my question to you last month. First Minister. Uh, I hope Sarah Boyett will forgive me. I answered a lot of questions last month uh, in the session, uh, rightly so. I, I, don't, I can't remember exactly what the subject matter of our question was. Um, there may be a good reason why we have not been able to respond yet, but I will make sure that is looked into um, as soon as I get uh, away from the session today. Um, in relation to the first uh, point, we have been looking at this, and I personally have been looking at this over the last few days. Um, we uh, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong in any point of the detail here, but I don't think I am. Uh, we are not able in uh, the Scottish Government to unilaterally change the cost of the NHS test that is decided uh, through the UK Government, um, because that, in many respects, would be the simplest thing to do, but we are not able to do that unilaterally. So we have been looking at whether we can open access to privately provided tests. The reason we haven't done that so far is concerns about uh, the quality of the service, about the, the turnaround times of the tests and the reporting of the tests to allow proper analysis and reporting. Uh, there has been further work uh, underway, um, including uh, work that I know the UK Government has been doing, looking at uh, making sure that there are performance uh, standards mandated for private providers. Um, and we're looking at that right now to see whether that then opens up uh, the possibility of uh, tests being accessible from other providers at lower cost. But I hope everybody, and particularly uh, Sarah Boyack, I, I know uh, where she comes from on issues like this, I hope everybody would recognise that making sure that, it would give, that people have access to quality tests and that the service around that is of an acceptable standard, given what we're dealing with here, is really important. And that's why we have thus far mandated NHS tests. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you very much, President Officer. While it is very much welcome that we are seeing a route to normality, can the First Minister highlight where anyone who may be apprehensive about readjusting to changing restrictions can access support should they actually require it? First Minister. Well, as I indicated in my statement, we will be issuing guidance uh, advising people of the basic things that we can all do and all should still do to try to minimise the risk of transmission. I set out why it is no longer in our judgment necessary or proportionate and therefore if we can't satisfy those tests we can't always satisfy that these things are lawful to keep legal restrictions in place uh, on all these issues uh, but we will still advise people that uh, when you're with people you don't know keeping a safe distance is, is a sensible mitigation if you're going to somewhere particularly indoors and it's very crowded, perhaps don't go when it's so crowded. Um, hand washing, really, really important. Personally, this is a personal thing. I'm not sure I'll start shaking hands with people uh, immediately because uh, you know there are other ways to, to reduce the risk. So these are all things that we all have to think about in terms of our own uh, risk uh, approach and to try to operate in a way that reduces the risk. So we will issue guidance. That's the first thing that we'll do to try to help people with that. There will be information continues to be available through all of the usual Scottish Government sources. And as I said earlier on, particularly for those who have been at the highest risk and who previously shielded, the Chief Medical Officer will, as he has done on previous occasions, write directly to them with bespoke specific advice about how uh, risk can be mitigated and so that uh, those in that category, like the rest of us, can responsibly enjoy the greater 
uh, the greater uh, easing of restrictions that we are now looking forward to. I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Eleanor Whittam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It was reported recently that Aberdeen has the third lowest proportion of double jagged people in Scotland. And now, last week, NHS Grampian reported more than 100 positive COVID cases in 24 hours. So, can I ask, what is the government doing now, specifically in the North East, to address this and change these worrying statistics for the better? First Minister. Vaccine uptake is high in every part of Scotland. I said earlier on, I think our uh, coverage of the population for first and second doses now is higher than than it is in England. Um, there are regional variations, just as there will be variations between different age groups. And every health board, um, including NHS Grampian, I know is working hard here and now, probably as we speak. And there are people working to try to get vaccines uh, to the remainder of those in the eligible groups who haven't yet come forward. Um, and no stone will be left unturned uh, to do that. Uh, but in saying that, let's also remember that vaccine uptake is high. I, I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. If even in the younger age groups, at the start of this year, as we embarked on this programme, uh, my advisers had told me that we would reach the percentage uptake that we have done, I would have struggled to believe that was possible. So this is an outstanding success. But the job now is to make sure that we don't let up until we have literally got the vaccine uh, to everybody who's eligible or as close to that as it is possible to do. Such is the interest in this important statement that there are still more than 20 members keen to ask a question, and I'd be very grateful for succinct questions and responses. I call Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have been contacted by immunosuppressed constituents who have received both doses of the COVID vaccination. They have raised their concerns that due to the medication they are taking following organ transplants, that they will not produce sufficient antibodies to protect themselves against the virus. Can I ask the First Minister what consideration the Scottish Government have given to providing antibody tests to immunosuppressed people to assess the effectiveness of the vaccination and whether any further guidance will be issued to this vulnerable group as restrictions continue to be lifted? First Minister. Uh so, no, so I, I will try to be briefer in my answers, but I do want to do justice to some of these really important uh, questions that uh, I know some people will be listening to the answers to. So I'm happy to stand here for as long as necessary to get through all of the questions. Uh, you're in charge of the timing, but uh, just to be clear uh, that I'm happy to do that. Um, on this, this is an important issue um, that I know is of concern to people uh, with suppressed immune systems. Uh, currently, the guidance from the Chief Medical Officer is to focus on using antibody tests to improve our understanding of COVID and in the clinical management of patients where that is appropriate. However, clinicians, including GPs, have the discretion to request an antibody test for an individual if they think the result of that will be of benefit to the clinical management of the patient. Uh, we know the vaccine offers significant protection against the virus, but we don't yet have evidence of exactly how effective it is for people with an impaired immune system. Therefore, uh, any uh, constituents uh, in this position should continue to be cautious about keeping themselves safe and to take sensible precautions, such as, of course, the wearing of face coverings. Uh, research is ongoing to further our understanding of the immune response to COVID vaccinations uh, in patients with immune suppressed uh, conditions. And obviously, uh, as we understand more about that, the advice and guidance we give will be updated. Paul O'Kane to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, having raised the issue of the need for a digital vaccine pass for in travel over the weekend, I do know that the First Minister outlined that uh, such a digital app will be available from next month. It would be helpful to have a, a clearer timescale on that, if possible, uh, given that um, some of the, the commentary around it has been vague in the past. Constituents have been rightly asking why it has taken us so long in Scotland to have a digital app, given that this exists elsewhere in the UK and uh, in other parts of Europe. But will the First Minister confirm uh, that the app will be compatible with vaccination records across the UK, particularly for um, students who are perhaps travelling for university? And indeed, will she ensure that where um, somebody has had one dose of the vaccine in Scotland and one in another nation of the UK or vice versa, that, that can be reflected in the app? Because I know that from constituents that's already been problematic with the paper copy. First Minister. 
Uh, it's a important question, although I would say that I indicated at the last uh, parliamentary statement, I think I've indicated before that, that this app was in development. So um, I, I'm sure uh, I, I give credit to Paul Lacain uh, in suggesting that it was his call for it at the weekend that led to my statement today, but it's been under development for uh, quite some time. Uh, the timetable, I, I'm not able to give an exact date, but we uh, anticipate that the app will launch by the, the middle of next month uh, at the latest, and obviously we will try to uh, accelerate that if at all possible. Um, we are working with UK governments uh, on uh, making sure there's consistency in terms of the approaches, although we have different systems um, that we are using here in Scotland. Um, and in terms of the points about, uh, in fact, the paper-based system uh, right now for vaccine certification, we've, we've also been working on uh, the, the wording and the, the branding of, of things like that as well. The, the questions about the use between the, the four nations, yes, compatibility and consistency, consistency is important, but I would refer back to my earlier statements uh, and uh, my earlier answers on this today. We have not yet decided whether we will seek uh, to use vaccine certification for domestic purposes in Scotland. So uh, we are developing the functionality to make that possible, but we have not yet taken the decision uh, that that functionality will be used. Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you highlighted that the Scottish Government is funding nine research projects into long COVID, which will help build the services that will be needed to deal with the implications of long COVID. But what steps is the Scottish Government taking to ensure sufferers can share their experience with the specialists currently working in the country's long COVID strategy? First Minister. It's a really important point. Um, we have worked closely with the Health and Social Care Alliance uh, to understand the views and experiences of people uh, living with long-term conditions generally, but including uh, long uh, COVID as we remobilise services in the health service generally, but also as we consider our response to long COVID. Um, and officials continue to engage with third sector organisations and patient groups in order to further inform the approach to long COVID to ensure uh, that people are receiving the best possible care in the right settings uh, and with the right specialist uh, approach behind it. Pam Gossel to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister said that office working would begin to return from June, but now we are in August and it still has not restarted. Only last week I spoke to the Scottish Chamber of Commerce and businesses are eager to get staff back into the offices. Will the First Minister commit to publishing a plan for staggering the return of office workers and the data behind her government's approach to the sequencing of the phased return? First Minister. Uh, again, I'll be corrected if I'm uh, mixing this up with something else. There, there is guidance, uh, and if it hasn't been published, I will look to see if it can be published, uh, although it may well have been published, but there is guidance on uh, the phased return uh, to offices, um, and we'll continue to work with businesses and, and with sectors about that. But again, this is one of these issues where I know people are, or not everybody is desperate to get back to the office, but many people are, employers and indeed some workers now will be keen to to get back to the office. But we've got to make sure we do this at the right pace, uh, because if we don't, all we run the risk of doing is setting back our progress and, and taking everything uh, in the wrong direction. And that's not responsible. And you know, I, my, my biggest responsibility here is to take the decisions I think are necessary, regardless of how unpopular uh, they are or how unpopular they might make me. Because uh, if, if I don't do that, then I'm not doing a service to the country. Uh, so we'll continue to try to get this right. Uh, the last thing I would say here, though, and, and I know because uh, I've, I've had conversations with some, most businesses are not planning a wholesale return to the office. Uh, most businesses are thinking about a new normal where, yes, they would want to see more of their workers back in the office, but they recognise it might not be exactly as it was pre-COVID. And, and I think that's an approach to encourage. Uh, the Scottish Government is looking to a more hybrid model of home and office working, uh, and I think not just for the purposes of controlling COVID, but even after COVID, there are issues of well-being, there are environmental uh, issues that surround these debates. And at an early stage of this pandemic, we all talked about not necessarily coming out of the other end and going back exactly to normal. Um, and this is one of these areas where perhaps a bit of pause for thought um, and a consideration of the best way of working in the future 
is appropriate. Um, we know there are other reasons to want people back in offices, city centre economies, for example. Can't dismiss any of that. But this is a moment to think seriously about what balance we want to seek to strike in the future. Emma Harper to be followed by Katie Clark. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the further easing of COVID-19 restrictions, which allows people to meet up in greater numbers. But more people indoors means more risk of COVID-19 virus spread. But this can be mitigated by good ventilation, as the First Minister has described by introducing CO2 monitoring in schools, and even HEPA air filtration for virus that is aerosolised as well. So can the First Minister expand on introduction of CO2 monitoring and whether further support in ventilation or HEPA filtration for public, third sector or business places, whether that is being considered? Thank you. First Minister. As I indicated earlier on, I think a focus on ventilation and better ventilation in places like schools, but in across the public and private sectors, is is really important as we return uh, to greater normality. And I, I think we need to have a much greater focus on that, which I've set out today in relation to schools. But we have issued guidance emphasising the need to ensure good ventilation across all indoor settings. Um, and that guidance does include reference to the possibility of using air cleaning or air filtration devices. And so we're currently considering uh, what further steps we can take to support good practice in ventilation across all settings, regardless of where they are. And this does uh, include, uh, I can confirm, consideration of the role of air cleaning and air filtration technology. Katie Clark, to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the SNP First Steps document committed to establish a COVID public inquiry within 100 days of the election. Could the First Minister outline what steps have been taken to establish a public inquiry and when we can expect to hear a start date, remit and chairperson announce? First Minister. Well, just in point of fact, that's not what uh, our First Steps document said. It did say that we would uh, take uh, steps and, and do the initial work with a view to setting up uh, a public inquiry. It did not say that the public inquiry would be established within the first 100 days. It remains my commitment to have a public inquiry up and running uh, within this calendar year. And uh, we are currently considering the steps we need to take uh, to do that. Uh, we will fulfil the terms of our 100 days commitment. Um, and we will set out as soon as possible uh, for uh, exactly how we intend to take forward uh, the commitment to public inquiry. We are, of course, and I've been very open about this, and I would be getting criticism if I wasn't doing this. We are talking to the UK government about the potential remit of the public inquiry it has committed to, so that we understand what issues uh, it is going to be looking at, and therefore what issues a separate Scottish public inquiry would look at, and how all of that would interact, and we'll set out uh, more of our uh, considerations about that shortly. John Mason, to be followed by Beatrice Wishart. Uh, thank you. Uh, the First Minister has already mentioned uh, booster jags or third jags, and I just wonder if she could give any more information about that. Um, I mean, for example, uh, are we going to be using pharmacies more, as we do with the flu jags? And also, depending what uh, vaccine we use, are there sufficient supplies available? First Minister. Um, the detail uh, that I can give at the moment is the detail laid out in the interim advice uh, from the JCVI, and of course that is uh, currently being used as part of our planning process. Uh, that recommends that a booster programme, if that is the final recommendation, should begin in early September uh, so that we maximise protection in those who are most vulnerable ahead of the winter months. Um, it is recommended that any booster programme is offered in two stages. Firstly, to those prioritised by the JCVI as part of the vaccination rollout, uh, notably those with suppressed immune systems and care homes, clinically vulnerable frontline health and care workers and over 70s. And the second phase would be to those over 50, uh, those aged 16 to 49 uh, and clinically vulnerable unpaid carers, other adult carers and those living in households with someone who has a suppressed immune system. In terms of the uh, operationalising of that, that planning work is underway. And just as we have done uh, with the initial vaccination programme, uh, we will want to uh, get any booster programme done as quickly as possible 
um, but also as accessibly as possible. So we'll be looking carefully again at the appropriate settings uh, for uh, JAGs to be offered, and more detail of that will be set out in due course. Beatrice Wisher to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Schools will soon return, but while the vaccine means the virus is now a different beast, it's estimated that one in five teachers will be without full vaccine protection when they go back in a fortnight. Our FOI request found vulnerable teachers contacting the government in droves last year, anxious and asking for better safety measures. What assurance can the First Minister offer that the government will listen to teachers this time round? First Minister. Uh, we have listened to teachers all along, but we also uh, follow the expert advice of the JCVI on the order of vaccination. And I've said many times before, um, the same people who call on me to do something different to the expert advice would probably be the first to criticise me uh, if I chose as a politician to uh, second guess and overturn uh, the advice of the experts. Um, on the, the vaccination hasn't made the vaccine a different beast. The vaccine, the, the virus, sorry, uh, is the same beast as it's always been, although it has mutated a little bit. The vaccine is helping us to combat the beast of the virus. So it's absolutely right to talk about the need to get vaccine as quickly as possible to everybody in the eligible groups. And teachers uh, have been vaccinated in line with the priority uh, set out by the JCVI. So everybody, every teacher over 40, for example, will already have had the offer uh, for their second dose. Any teacher over 18 will have the offer of their first dose, um, and second doses will be underway um, as of now for the eight weeks uh, after uh, first doses where the offer of first doses were completed. So this has been done quickly. It's been done uh, in line with the JCVI recommendations, um, and teachers uh, will, every day that passes, more and more teachers uh, will be getting the, vac the protection of full vaccination. Graham Simpson to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I want to ask about face coverings. The First Minister has made it clear that she thinks the um, law on face coverings should remain, but she'll be aware that a couple of weeks ago that restriction was removed in England, and actually most people are choosing to continue to wear them. So can the First Minister tell us what actually needs to happen here for her to change her mind on face coverings so that we can enjoy the same freedoms as they do in England? First Minister. I'm, I don't want to get overly philosophical here, but I'm really confused about Graham Simpson's concern here. If his argument is that everybody's going to wear face coverings anyway, why is he so concerned that we are asking people to wear face coverings? It, and if he thinks that everybody's going to wear face coverings anyway, what freedom is it that he thinks people need to have to do? I, I'm genuinely, maybe I'm, I've been on my feet for too long today, I'm genuinely struggling to understand, other than just trying to find a, a point of disagreement with uh, the Scottish Government, what the, the real point of, of that question is. We think it's really important that people continue to wear face coverings, so we're going to tell them we think it's really important uh, by saying that the law requires them to wear face coverings. We'll keep that under review. But if at the end of the day Graham Simpson is saying he agrees that everybody should wear face coverings, then how we choose to do that seems to me to be of secondary, <laughs> secondary concern. So if I'm missing something that I apologise, but I think it's right to say to people you should still wear face coverings. Christine Graham to be followed by Megan Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I refer to the importance of the Test and Protect Act? It may be that familiarity is breeding contempt, but it seems that anecdotally, increasing numbers of people are either don't have the app active either through omission or deliberately. Will the Scottish Government therefore publicise anew the importance of the app being live, essential to accurate contact tracing, the reduce the spread of the virus, perhaps even more necessary as restrictions are lifted? First Minister. Uh, yes, indeed, we will uh, give consideration to doing that. I think that's a, a perfectly sensible suggestion. Um, I, I think, in fact, I think the numbers bear this out. The vast majority of people who downloaded the app still have the app downloaded on their phone and still uh, use it. Uh, there will be some people who don't realise it's maybe switched off for some reason and, and forget to switch it back on. Um, so regularly reminding people of that will be important. Test and Protect is going to continue to be important, and therefore 
using that app continues to be a really important way of helping test and protect. And if we help test and protect, we help the rest of us as well. So we'll give consideration to reminding people of the importance of that. Megan Gallagher to be followed by Jim Fairley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Parties have raised concerns over the barriers faced by some people transitioning from child to adult mental health services. Some of the barriers include outdated transition guidelines, too short a transition period, inconsistency between the diagnosis and treatment available across the different services, and communication. As we emerge from the pandemic, will the Scottish Government commit to improving continuity for young people moving from child to adult mental health services? First Minister. Uh, yes, and, uh, and that is uh, a, an important issue to raise. I'll ask the Health Secretary to write to the member with more detail of the work we're doing um, on uh, mental health uh, generally, but on that issue in particular. Um, the question is about mental health, and I think it's important to focus on mental health, but this transition from child to adult services can be a, a challenge in all aspects of health care, um, in cancer care, for example, I, I know it is a challenge. So it's, it, it's one of these issues that we need to make sure we focus on and get right and continue to, to learn and adapt. And but obvious, for obvious reasons, that has particular importance in the field of mental health. So I very much agree with the premise of the question. And as I say, I will make sure more detail on exactly what is being done is provided. Jim Fairley, to be followed by Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, First Minister, I have a constituent who lost her wife to COVID last October, uh, Jane Morrison, and her wife was only 49 when she died. And I'd like to put on record I'm passing my sincere condolences to her and everyone else who's lost a loved one. But the government had agreed that they would hold a judge-led human rights-based public inquiry with the rel relatives of the deceased consulted on the terms of reference. And I know that you did answer a question on this earlier on, but can the First Minister confirm that the bereaved families will be central to this inquiry, and will the Scottish Government also engage with stakeholders, including bereaved family groups such as Cruise Scotland? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I can give that assurance, and, and I want to give that assurance very strongly. I, uh, well, I also would want to convey uh, my condolences to Jim Fairley's uh, constituent. I met, uh, I think, just before uh, Parliament uh, broke for the election with the uh, bereaved uh, COVID bereaved families group. It, it may be actually, um, although I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, that Mr. Fairley's constituent was was part of uh, that discussion. Um, so it was impressed upon me, uh, and uh, I didn't take much persuasion, uh, but it was impressed upon me the importance to families of being properly and fully consulted in all aspects of establishing a public inquiry, uh, the remit in particular, and to be front and centre of any public inquiry as it uh, undertakes its work. And that's a commitment I, I will give. I also repeat the commitment to a human rights-based inquiry. I think that is exceptionally important. Um, and also uh, give the commitment, as requested by Mr Fairley, to liaison not just with the, the groups of bereaved families, uh, but also with uh, other uh, organisations that give assistance to uh, families suffering bereavement, and Cruz was mentioned, and no doubt there will be others. So I, I very strongly uh, commit to all of these things. Monica Lennon, to be followed by Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We heard the First Minister confirm that consideration has been given to the limited use of COVID data certification for access to certain higher risk venues. Can the First Minister elaborate on what she means by higher risk venues? And could this include care homes, which weren't mentioned in the statement today and continue to be subject to restrictions on visiting? First Minister. I do not favour the use of vaccine passports for access to, to, to care homes. Uh, there may be arguments that can be made, but um, I don't know if Monica Lennon heard. It certainly wasn't my statement, but I think I gave uh, this in answer to Patrick Harvey or Liam MacArthur. I would be very strongly opposed to using vaccine uh, certification or COVID certification for access to public services or places where people have no option but to go and, and obviously visiting people in care homes. That is not to say that I, I do not believe we have to take the most stringent measures to protect uh, vulnerable people in care homes. Uh, but we uh, also have to make sure that people have access to care homes. 
I'm not going to elaborate too much uh, further on this because we haven't taken decisions, and I think it's important Parliament is properly and fully consulted. Obviously, the kind of setting that has been talked about and is most often talked about are places like nightclubs, um, places where young people, not all young people, but many young people uh, like to go that have risks, higher risks of transmission, where not as a substitute for other precautions, but as an additional measure, it is possible that there is an argument that can be made that that is something we should uh, do. I am not convinced yet that that is definitely the case, uh, and no decision has been taken, which is why um, I continue to voice caution and give a commitment to fully involve Parliament in these decisions. Siobhan Brown to be followed by J.B. Halcrow Johnston. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is very encouraging that so many pregnant women in Scotland have taken the vaccination. The evidence has been overwhelming and shows that getting vaccinated is the best way to keep both pregnant women and their unborn children safe from COVID-19. But can I ask what assurances can the First Minister provide to women who might still have concerns and what support and information is available to them? Thank you. First Minister. Uh, well, thanks. This is, uh, again, a, a really important issue, um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to reiterate uh, our advice on this. Uh, the vaccines that are available in the UK uh, have been shown to be effective and safe, and that's an important assurance. Um, in line with guidance uh, from the JCVI, Uh, pregnant women who have concerns can discuss these concerns with a clinician um, and get the latest evidence on safety and uh, obviously what vaccines they will receive. But vaccination is the best way of protecting against the risks of COVID in pregnancy. That includes admission of uh, the pregnant mother to intensive care, but also the possible premature birth of the baby. I would ask all members to do everything they can to get that message across. Uh, to pregnant women to take up the offer of vaccination as soon as it is available. I uh, noticed, and it was drawn to my attention yesterday, I think, that uh, voices in the Royal College of Midwives in putting forward this sensible advice and doing that uh, rightly uh, were subjected to all sorts of abuse from anti-vaxxer uh, voices on social media. And I want to uh, condemn that uh, and show my solidarity to those uh, professionals who are giving important and responsible messages to people who stand to benefit so much from vaccination. Jamie Halcrow Johnston to be followed by Claire Adamson. Uh, thank you. The First Minister has confirmed today that she feels there is a debate to be had on vaccine passports and that the Scottish Government is still considering their use for access to certain high risk venues. So can I ask the First Minister when a final decision will be made on vaccine passports and which sectors are currently being consulted with on any potential introduction? First Minister. Uh, no, I, I'm not going to give a, a date, uh, not least because Parliament has to be fully involved in, in all of these discussions uh, as well. And if I was to say by such and such a date we're going to have decided this, then I wouldn't be doing justice to, to parliamentary uh, consultation. Um, and I think it's important that we consider all of this carefully uh, and consult with, with sectors that, that could possibly be part of that debate. Um, and there's work to be done on this. Uh, we're seeking to have a Four Nations uh, discussion, although when the Prime Minister announced uh, that they were going to use vaccine passports for, for nightclubs, uh, we weren't consulted in advance. In fact, that was a change in what we thought was the position of the UK government. So uh, we'll try to have sensible discussions across the UK, but fundamentally take decisions in proper consultation with Parliament that we think are right for Scotland. And we'll do that uh, with all of the, the proper discussion and consideration that I think is appropriate, given the sensitivities around this issue. I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, health and social care services across the country are under immense pressure, and we saw severe pressure in Lanarkshire last week on the health and social service, GP practices and hospitals. Can I ask the First Minister for an update on the services in Lanarkshire? On what steps can my constituents in Motherwell and Wisha take to alleviate pressure on these services and ensure that those most urgent in need are effectively prioritised? First Minister. Well, in answer to the question, what can all of us do? 
uh, even as legal restrictions lift, we can all behave in a way that minimises the risk of COVID transmission because the uh, the more we reduce the pressure from COVID on our National Health Service, the more we enable our National Health Service uh, to catch up with the backlog and treat non-COVID uh, patients as quickly as they want to do. And, and we all have a responsibility, and the vast majority of people have taken that responsibility to protect our NHS extremely seriously since the start of uh, the pandemic. Uh, the government continues to uh, work through our NHS recovery plan, which, as I indicated earlier on, will be published uh, shortly, um, and to make additional uh, resources and other support available to health boards. So, for example, NHS Lanarkshire uh, would uh, have received their share of additional funding to support reducing waiting times for urgent and emergency care, uh, and also the funding to boost staffing levels and available beds. We also remain in daily contact with boards as they manage their capacity effectively between COVID and non-COVID care. Um, and the last thing I would say is we're very conscious. I'm very conscious of the ongoing pressure on those who work in health and care. Um, and that's why it's really important that we do all of these things and indeed more uh, to support them as effectively as possible. Gillian Mackay to be followed by Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the First Minister's commitment to continue to provide support to those who are eligible if they are required to, to self-isolate. Given that the latest figures show that only 24.2 per cent of people aged 18 to 29 have received two doses of the vaccine, many will be unable to take advantage of exemptions to self-isolation and will therefore be greatest affected by isolation requirements. Will the First Minister consider extending self-isolation support to those who are not yet or who cannot be double vaccinated so that they are not unfairly penalised? First Minister. I will certainly consider that. I, I can, obviously, until considering it, give a, a, a guarantee that we will do it. But uh, there is certainly the point that we will uh, have fewer people that are requiring to self-isolate for 10 days, and therefore uh, we, it may enable us to, to look to extend uh, the eligibility for that support. So I, I will certainly undertake to, to go away and look at that. Obviously, the numbers of people in the youngest age group, the 18 to 29-year-olds, who are double dose, will be rising on a daily basis. The, low figure there is not uh, indicative uh, of low uptake. It is indicative of the fact that first doses came later. Uh, so the eight-week interval for second doses means that not all young people are yet eligible for their second dose. But obviously, that is a moving picture uh, with every day that passes. But it is a, it's a reasonable suggestion and one that I will undertake to explore further. Julian Mackay to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Just being... Sorry, my apologies. Jackie Dunbar. Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the tourism and aviation industries have been particularly and severely impacted by restrictions. Can the First Minister provide an update as to the Scottish Government's latest engagement with the UK Government regarding what support can be made available to these sectors while restrictions on international travel remain in place? First Minister. Engagement with the UK Government on all of these issues is, as you would expect it to be, ongoing. I will uh, ensure that some further information uh, about the detail of that and when we last uh, engaged on particular issues around tourism and aviation is provided to Jackie Dunbar. Um, we have always been frank that the impact on aviation and, by extension, uh, on tourism, certainly international tourism into Scotland, the impact of that is going to be longest lasting, um, and therefore it is important that we continue to uh, do what we can to support these sectors and encourage the UK Government to do likewise. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Long COVID could be affecting over 100,000 Scots and may have a major long term impact on people's health, our public services, and our economy with general practitioners having to deal with the lion's share of the extra workload. Can I ask the First Minister what her response is to the Royal College of General Practitioners, who are calling on her to boost the GP workforce? First Minister. Well, we continue to support uh, expanded staffing across the National Health Service. and Of course, uh, we uh, look to support our NHS uh, workers in various different ways. I've, I won't repeat. Uh, everything I've said about the work we're doing around long COVID, that is important, and no doubt uh, we'll talk more about that in weeks and months to come. 
Um, there is often a contradiction here, though, in, in terms of long COVID, uh, when people, like the member has just done, rightly talks about the risks of long COVID uh, in one breath, but then, to be fair to him, not him in uh, that question, but some of his colleagues also call on us to be less cautious about our approach to the virus. Uh, we've got to make sure the services are there for long COVID, that GPs and others are supported to deal with what they have to deal with. But we also need to make sure that we continue to show the caution that minimises the number of people who will get COVID and therefore the number of people who will suffer from long COVID. So all of that, of course, hangs together. And all of that is in the interest of GPs as well as in the interest of everyone else. Emma Roddick to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I appreciate the information that has been given so far this afternoon on forthcoming G JCVI advice on vaccinating under-18s. Uh, can I also ask the First Minister if the advice expected in the next day or so does recommend expanding the vaccine programme to include students, whether every student will be offered a first dose before they start university in September? First Minister. I, I don't want to go much further. Uh, I, I absolutely understand the importance of these things, but you know, as I've said we're expecting JCVI advice. Obviously, I have to wait and see uh, what that advice says. Uh, if it does say that we should go beyond the current groups of young people in terms of vaccination, I need to wait and see exactly what order it proposes for that. As I have said, I am hoping there will be a priority for 16 and 17 year olds for the reasons uh, that we understand. But I don't know. It may be that the JCVI decides to uh, recommend some different approach. So uh, before getting into commitments to dates, we need to see what that advice is. What I can say is that we will move to operationalise and implement any new recommendations as quickly as we can. And in trying to um, encourage the JCVI to uh, look at this again and to do so uh, as quickly as possible, we've been very mindful of our earlier uh, return to school date than other parts of the UK, but also mindful of the fact that all of us uh, have the return of colleges and universities looming soon too. And Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. First Minister, my constituent received their first COVID vaccine in England and their second in Scotland. I understand the NHS here in Scotland are struggling to get confirmation of the details of the first vaccine to allow them to issue the relevant official documentation to confirm my constituent has indeed been double jabbed. What steps have been taken to ensure that this crucial information is transferred accurately and securely across UK health services, something that will become increasingly important, particularly as students, many of whom will have had their first jab elsewhere in the UK, arrive in Scotland to study? First Minister. Um, I, if Bob Doris uh, will allow me, I will take that away and come back to him with more detail. I would also be grateful if, if he wishes to, if he can pass the details of his constituents to see if we can help uh, speed up that process. But uh, that is something we need to make sure if it's not happening uh, as smoothly as it needs to, then I will uh, undertake to make sure we give attention uh, to working with other governments in the UK to improving that. And that concludes the First Minister's statement on COVID-19 update. There will be a brief pause before we commence the next item of business. <laughs>